Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you today. So glad you could make it. I want you to turn with me in your Bible, please, to the book of Philippians, chapter 2. We're going to continue talking on God's protection, which we shared with you last week. I want to actually dig a little deeper into some of the things that we were sharing. Philippians, chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, let this mind be in you means think this way. Think think this way. So, this is a way that we're supposed to think. Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God? Now, that's, that's quite a bit right there for you to think that way. Think, he, he, he was in the form of God, but didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now, are we as smart and are we as pure, holy as God is? Well, of course not. But one of the things I want you to realize is this, and that is that you are in God's class. You are His children. So you have ability, you have dominion and authority as God exercises dominion and authority. So are we able to exercise dominion and authority because we are created in His image and in His likeness, so, which is what this passage of Scripture is talking about here. Verse 7, But He made Himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Now I want you to notice one of the things He's doing is He... This is talking about, it it talks about that that Jesus was equal with God. And this is talking about when he was in heaven. And then he came to the earth in the likeness of men. Made himself of no reputation. One translation says he laid all of his godly attributes aside. And the way that I like to think of it that will help you is uh, when you're going at the airport and you go through one of the metal detectors, if, if, you, if you try to go through one of those metal detectors with all of your weaponry, if you, if you have a firearm or a, or a knife that's bigger, actually, I was fixing to say bigger than a little pocket knife, but they'll take those too. You can't, can't have one at all. <clears throat> so, I mean, they'll even get fingernail clippers. So, um, anything like that, if you go through that metal detector, it's going to catch you, and you have to leave all that behind in order to board the aircraft. Well, that's, it, that's kind of what this is talking about here. That's a good analogy of what it's talking about. Jesus, when he came to the earth, all of the attributes, all of the things that made him God, he had to leave behind when he came to the earth. He had to come to earth as a man. Now, he was God. He was the word of God in flesh. But I want to remind you of something, and that is that the only thing that Jesus, well, let me back up just one moment. Jesus healed people, didn't he? Did Jesus perform miracles? Did he feed multitudes of people with a small amount of food? He raised the dead. Did, did, he, did he calm waters? Or, or did, he, did, he, did he speak to uh, natural things and, and they obeyed him? Yeah. But one of the things I want to bring to your attention is none of that was new. Right? Right? Were there people in the Old Testament that were raised from the dead? Yes, as a matter of fact, if you'll recall, there was, there was one uh, uh, soldier that was killed in battle, and they were getting overrun, and so they just took him and threw him kind of in a hole. It was actually a grave, and they threw him in the, in the, uh, in the grave of the prophet, and when, the, when, that, when that dead soldier hit the bones of that dead prophet, he came back to life. So there was enough anointing. That's a whole other sermon within itself right there. There was enough anointing left in the dead prophet's bones to raise somebody from the dead. That's, that's pretty good. So we, we had people raised from the dead. We had uh, uh, Elijah raise somebody from the dead. So Jesus raising Lazarus, that, that was not new. Miraculous, certainly, but it was not new. 
Uh, Jesus calming the waves on the Sea of Galilee. Well, do we find in the Old Testament uh, a man of God being able to speak to water and commanding it to do things? Well, yeah, Moses, uh, he, he did that. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Elisha. After Elijah went up, Elisha came back. When, when Elijah's mantle came on, Elisha, uh, Elisha took that mantle, that cloak, and walked up to the Jordan River and said, Where is the God of Elijah? And hit that water. And you know what happened? It parted the Jordan River. So Jesus wasn't the only one that had commanded water to change its course or to be held back. Uh, Jesus, what, Jesus wasn't the only one that had multiplied food. Uh, Elijah and the widow woman, remember? Uh, food was multiplied. So we find those things in the Old Testament. So the, the miracles that we find where Jesus was concerned, those miracles had been done before. Keep in mind, Jesus was operating as a prophet under the Old Covenant. Jesus did not do any... Now listen to me very carefully. Don't check out on me here. Jesus didn't do any of those things as the Son of God. He did them simply as an anointed prophet operating the way that the other prophets had operated. However, he did do something as the Son of God. And the thing that he did as God was he died. He was the spotless Lamb of God who bore the sins of all of mankind on him. He did that as God. was crucified, dead, buried, and gloriously rose from the grave three days later. So all of that story is, is kind of summed up in what, what he's talking about here. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, verse 9. After that, after he was raised up, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those things in heaven, those things on the earth and those things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen goes right there. So, after he was raised up, after he had defeated death, hell, and the grave, he was raised up gloriously, and God exalted him, honored him. Uh, he was seated at the right hand of the Father. He's now making intercession for us waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. That's what he's doing right now. Now, in that process, God gave him a name that is above every name. And at the, at the sound of that name, every knee has to bow. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about that name is this. We as believers have the authority, have the right to use that name that is above every name. Now, there are people that use the name of Jesus that don't have the right to use it. There are people that invoke the name of Jesus all the time. It's usually cussing. Nothing's, not, nothing's going to happen good when somebody does that. You have the ability and the power, the authority, if you will, to use that name. It, think of it this way. Think of it also as a... Uh, as an ambassador or an emissary that's, that's, that's in a country on behalf of another king, a, a, another kingdom. Well, when that emissary goes to that other nation, they speak on behalf of the king. And they have the ability and the authority to make decisions, and it's just as binding if that, as if that king was there because they're the king's representative. That's the way that we operate. When you are born again, when you are born into the kingdom of God, you have the ability, you have the right to use the name of Jesus. I cannot emphasize to you how important that is in your life. There are some times that things come against you. There are some times that you are hit with things and, and you just, for some reason, you can't think of of, of, of a particular scripture verse, or you just, you just don't know what to do? Well, let me share something with you. The name of Jesus will get you out of any jam you get into. If you understand what it is that you're doing when you speak that name, I mean, if you, 
If you say, oh, Jesus, what are we going to do? That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? I'm talking about exercising that name and understanding that when you speak it, everything stops. Any, any force from the kingdom of darkness that's trying to come against you has to honor, recognizes and has to honor that name. Now, that's one of the first things that is a very important thing in understanding where God's protection is concerned in our life. Now, we looked also, we don't, we're not going to turn there today, in Jeremiah, uh, where the Bible tells us that God is watching over His Word in Jeremiah 1.12. And, and some of the things that I want you to understand, go ahead, Madison, and put that up if you don't mind. Jeremiah 1.12. And I want you to put it up in the Amplified Bible, please. And as it's up there, I just want to remind you of a few things. Words are important. I remember my little bitty wife and I, when we, when we first started getting into this, this was back in about 1979, 1980, somewhere around there. And we started learning, uh, out of Proverbs chapter 18, we started learning that death and life were in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And we started learning that our words were important. And so we started helping one another. And I use that term loosely. Uh, we started helping one another where our words were concerned. And, and we read right there in our Bible that death and life are in the power of your tongue. Okay? I'm going to give you a quick quiz. Are you ready? I'm going to ask you a question. See if you know the answer to it. Where does the power of life and death reside? With God? With the angels? Where does the power of life and death reside? In our mouth, in our tongue. So, the words that we speak, I'm talking about you. The words that you speak in your life and the words that I speak in my life, they are either life or they're death. Now, Jesus said that they're also idle words, but He says you'll even judge for those. Idle words meaning words that don't necessarily contain power. One of the areas that you're judged on where idle words are concerned is you passed up an opportunity to speak words of faith and, and, and love and, and, and words of blessing. So we started learning things. We started learning. I mean, we were, we were like most everybody else as far as our speaking was concerned. And that is, you know, we, we used expressions like, well, you know, that just tickled me to death. God, it was so hot outside. I was out there mowing the yard. It's so hot. I thought I was going to die. Oh, my back's killing me. Now that I think about it, my leg's killing me too. Dear Lord, everything's killing me. I just, I just don't feel good. Now, those of you that have been around us, and most of you have been around us, you know, for quite some time. Some of you have been around us more than half your life. Some even their whole life. <laughs> you don't hear us talk like that. Have you ever heard one of us ever say, something's killing us? Have you ever heard either one of us ever say something? We see something, man, dear Lord, I, saw, I thought I was going to die. Why? Because we, now we had to help each other because we're like everybody else. And that is, it, it was a habit. You, don't, you say things like that and you don't even think. But when it says right there in the Word of God that death and life are in the power of your tongue, why in the world do I want to give voice to something that's trying to kill me? Why do I want to, to give something dominion in my life give it an avenue to come in look there's enough stuff out there that's going on without me giving things permission i, I remember there was a guy in uh, uh where we used to live that would go out and he'd go out running or, or jogging and he'd go over to, there was a, a college that was nearby and he would go out on the track and run and and every day just being you know he, he'd tell his wife he's he's going to leave or he said i'm going out here and, and, and run he said, I'll be back if lightning don't strike me. And he said that every day when he left, just being funny. Would y'all care to guess what killed that man? He was out on the track running one day. Got struck by lightning. Now, there are hundreds and thousands of examples of things like that happening in people's lives. You've got to be careful what it is that comes out of your mouth. 
That's why the Bible tells you if, if, if uh, uh, something comes, if pressure comes against you, wickedness comes against you, to take your hand and lay it over your mouth so that you don't allow those words to come out. There's, it's one thing in your life to get upset, to get angry. That happens to every, everybody has opportunities that come against them that, that we get upset. The thing that you've got to guard against when that happens is taking your hand and put it over your mouth. Do not allow those words to come out. Remember Jesus said over in uh, Matthew's Gospel, He said to take no thought saying, what shall we eat or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Remember when He was talking to them. Uh, so the way that you take a thought, there's thoughts that comes to, to, there are thoughts that come to everyone. When those thoughts come, the way that you take them and put them into practice or the way that you activate them is by speaking. Now, the good ones you want to activate. The bad ones you don't. Now, another thing that you need to be here, the Bible says here that you, you, uh, the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. So we looked at this last week. God's watching over his word, word to perform. Let me share with you some of the, one of the things that's not, that he's not doing. God is not active watching over your word to perform it. He's active watching over His Word to perform it. God desires for good things to happen in your life. And one of, the, one, of the, one of these days, we are going to get the revelation completely that it's really important what we say. And it's really important that we say what the Word says instead of saying what we feel or what Letting our emotions take over. Our fear-based emotions take over. We can't do that. You see a lot of that happening now. You know the Bible says over in Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Put that up for me, Madison. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. How does faith come? Does faith come by praying? So, can you pray? Can you get more faith by praying? No. Now, see, there's a lot of people who would have missed that question on the test, wouldn't they? Faith does not come by praying. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Now, this works. Every one of you in here have experienced this. Matter of fact, everybody in society has been experiencing a form of this just on the other side, on the negative side. What happens now when all of a sudden you get a tickle in your throat? <clears> throat> <clears throat> oh God, no. I got the coronas. <laughs> oh no, oh, but what is it I'm supposed to do? I'm supposed to drink something hot, lay down. Uh, what? You're out at the grocery store. Somebody gets it, some of you in here right now clearing your throat. <clears> throat> You're in the grocery store. Somebody two, two aisles over. <coughs> Everybody in the store. Oh, God. Somebody's over among the pickles over there. They got the Cronus. Quick, hurry. Grab up the children. Let's get to the other side of the store. Why do people think that way? Because every day... We have been hearing it over and over and over and over. And what has happened? Faith has come. Faith in the coronas. That's, that's the way everybody shortens it. They don't say coronavirus. They say the coronas. Oh, Lord, I done got the coronas. And so people, you hear somebody cough. Or, listen, 
those of you that live in Chattanooga, Tennessee, Chattanooga is like rated the third worst place in the country for allergies. Y'all do remember that, don't you? I mean, you had this stuff happening to you before. It's just now because of what you hear over and over and over. It's that those thoughts come. If you feel a little flush, baby, come here and check me, see if I got a fever. I think the coronas has done hit me. I done got zapped by the coronas. That person over by the sweet gherkins in the in the grocery store, they sneezed all over me. It traveled three aisles, got up in the air conditioning system, and it got me. I'm not saying that that's not a nasty virus, okay? I understand that it is, and I'm not making light of that, and I'm not making light of people that have got it and people that have even died from it. But what I'm saying is, it has changed the whole way that society is reacting towards things, and it's based on things because you are bombarded with this stuff every day, and you hear it over and over and over. You hear it on the negative side, it produces fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. It seems to me that, that things operate where this is concerned a lot more easily on the negative side of things than they do on the positive side. And the reason for that is because the world itself is going in a negative direction. So it's easier to, to believe things that way than it is. It, it takes effort to fight upstream in the positive. So you're hearing this over and over and over. Listen, if you're hearing that over and over and over, by the way, one of the easiest ways to, to, to keep from being concerned with that is turn the TV off. Don't listen to it. Don't listen to it. By speaking the word, by hearing the word of God and speaking the word of God, that causes the opposite to happen. That causes faith to rise on the inside of us. Now, we looked last week also at, at 1 Peter chapter 5. Now, I know when I say we looked last week, uh, as I mentioned, I, I wanted to go deeper into some things. So that's what we're doing. We're looking at some of the scriptures, but I'm sharing things with you that I didn't share last week. 1 Peter chapter 5, just as God is looking actively looking at His Word to perform it, so the enemy is looking. And we told the story last week about the wildebeest. You remember the story about the wildebeest? And I want to look here in, in 1 Peter 5, 8, because I want to show you something here that will help you. 1 Peter 5, 8 tells us to be sober, to be vigilant for our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion is going about seeking whom he may devour. Now, the first part of that verse of Scripture is be sober. Now, be sober means to be serious about this. Don't take this lightly. And be vigilant. Don't do this casually. Don't do it every now and then. Pay attention. Another word for this would be circumspect. Because your adversary, not your friend, not someone that God has subcontracted to teach the church, your adversary, and, and just in case you're wondering who this is talking about, your adversary, the devil. He's going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And one of the things that we looked at last week is the, the roaring part is a, a male lion will roar to scare its prey and they take off running away from the roar and they run into the ambush. You'll have to get last week's tape. We go into the detail about that. About the poor wildebeest. As a matter of fact, y'all need to pray for the wildebeest. Because they... You think you have it tough, they have it really tough. Everything's trying to eat them. I said last week, everything but what tries to eat wildebeest? Everything but small birds tries to eat them. So, so the, the male lion gives this roar that you can hear for miles, and, and the prey freak, and they run away from that roar, and the lionesses are hidden in the grass, and they run straight into the ambush. Your adversary, the devil, does the exact thing the exact, exact same thing to us. He roars. And when that roar happens, we panic 
and we run and do something. And we start acting out of fear. When you act out of fear, you open the door to the enemy. And that's what it is he's trying to get you to do. I want you to notice, uh, the Bible says that he's seeking whom he may devour. He cannot just devour anyone. He has to look. He is looking. He is looking for a particular characteristic so that he can attack someone. Would you be interested in knowing what that characteristic is? I mean, I would because I don't want to have that characteristic. Do you? Well, I usually teach this when we're in our new members class. And, and I, in this particular passage of Scripture, I like teaching it in reverse. And, and, and leading back up here, and it, it's really interesting where this, will, where this will take us. So, if you don't mind, let's um, back up to verse 6 and look at verse 6 and 7. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. Then the next verse is, be sober, be vigilant. So, apparently... One of the things that we're looking at is casting care on the Lord helps protect you. So the devil is looking for people that are hanging on to care. Right? People that are not trusting in the Lord and casting their care over on Him. Y'all know what I mean by casting? I usually have my keys on me. I don't this morning. I don't know if I want to throw that. All right, if I throw this, whoever I throw this to, you're going to have to give it back. All right? I'm not donating to your ministry. All of it. Yes, all of it. So, if I tell you to cast your care, um, is that casting care? No, that's not casting care. See, the reason that we did that is so it's close by so we can pick it back up if God doesn't do it as soon as we think it ought to be done. See, if we cast our care over on the Lord, Lord, I'm casting this care over on you, but I need you to take care of it by 4 o'clock this afternoon. And if you don't, then we pick it back up, right? Casting, you know, how many of you fish? You know, when you, when you cast a lure, you don't just boop, drop it right by your feet. You cast it away from you, right? Now, I'm not going to do it, but you would take it and throw it away from you. That's what casting your care over on the Lord is. So, in order to do that in verse 6, I know you're disappointed. Y'all thought I was going to throw this to you. So, casting your care on the Lord, according to verse 6, is somebody that humbles themselves. They're trusting in the Lord, and they humble themselves. Do you realize, let me remind you, and you need to write this down. Biblical humility, humbling yourself biblically, is receiving that for which you have not worked. That's what biblical humility is. Men, especially, have a hard time with that. Men have a hard time receiving something that they haven't worked for. You try to buy somebody's meal or something like that. Oh, no, 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 no. That's, that's, no, that's, I got it. Men don't do good receiving that. That's why sometimes, oftentimes men are not as sensitive spiritually as women are. It's just one, just one of the reasons. There's many other reasons. But, but men typically have a tendency to, to swing more towards pride, which is the opposite of what I'm talking about. As a matter of fact, we actually get to that in uh, verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to the elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So he's talking about younger people here. Younger people, don't be a know-it-all. Submit or learn from the older people. Listen. I tell my children 
listen to what it is that I tell you. Because I have made plenty of mistakes. There is no reason in you having to have the same mistakes that I've made. There's a whole bunch of new ones out there for you to make. So don't repeat the ones that I've done. Go have your own new mistakes. So you can learn from older people. And in order to do that, you have to humble yourself. Hmm. Well, let's see who, when it says to learn from your elders, let's see who it's talking about elders. So let's go back to verse 1 of chapter 5. I know this is unusual the way that we're doing this, but this just really kind of helps explain. The elders who are, this is Peter writing, the elders who are among you I exhort. I, who am a fellow, fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that w- will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. So he is addressing elders, and he is addressing a particular group of elders. He is aggr- addressing a group of elders who shepherd the flock of God. We have another word for that. What is that elder called? A pastor. The word shepherd and the word pastor in the New Testament are the same Greek word. It's the Greek word poimain. Same word. A pastor is a shepherd. So those elders that are among you, I'm I'm exhorting you, those elders that shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being an example to the flock. When the chief shepherd, the chief pastor, appears, you will receive the crown of glory and does not fade away. So at the beginning of chapter 5, who is Peter addressing? Pastors. So he addresses the pastors, and then he starts talking about how things operate. So, who is it the devil is looking to devour? People that are not submitted to a pastor. People that do not have a shepherd. Damn it. Pastors have to be careful, he addressed this, about lording over their flocks. About using their church as their little kingdom to do all their grunt work. I know y'all have seen that. You haven't seen it here, I trust. Beth and I take the last part of that verse of Scripture very seriously. And that is, we're not supposed to lord over you, but we are supposed to lead you by being examples to you. And that's when he goes into talking about Humbling yourself. It, it takes humility to do that. Now listen, you don't, you don't do that where a pastor is concerned because they're a hot shot, because they're knowledgeable, because, they're, they're, you know, because they've got a dynamic uh, uh, personality, because they're charismatic, because they're on TV, because they're on the radio, because they live in a nice house, because they're a good speaker. You, you don't do it because of that. You do it because, th- th- I, I tell you, this is what I do. Some of you may notice that I enjoy being around people. I love talking to people. Uh, I love engaging people. There is a reason that I do that. Aside from the fact that I'm just a friendly guy. But other than that, the reason that I do that is because over uh, in John's Gospel, Jesus said, My sheep know my voice, and the voice of a stranger they will not follow. Well, Jesus is the chief shepherd. Actually, Peter calls him the chief shepherd here. Jesus is the chief shepherd, so I am an under-shepherd. I'm a shepherd under the chief shepherd. Well, the chief shepherd said, 
My sheep know my voice, but the voice of a stranger they will not follow. Over in John chapter 10. Well, I just think the same way. I think that my sheep know my voice, and a voice of a stranger they will not follow. So when I'm out talking to people, I'll just start sharing things. I'll share some things about our church. I'll share some things about how we got here. I share some things about how the Lord uh, spoke to both of us and told us to come to Chattanooga, Tennessee. He spoke to us differently, two different times, told us to come to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Here we are. Well, when I'm telling that story, what happened, and it's happened many times, when I'm telling that story, people have come up and told me later, I don't know what it was, but when you were saying that, just something down on the inside of me told me I need to be there. That's what that is. That's my sheep know my voice. And the voice of a stranger they will not follow. There are people that God has ordained to be here at this church. There are people that God has ordained to be at churches all over the place. That, that, that they have put in their hearts their pastor. Somebody that says, I don't need a pastor. All they're trying to do is out to get your money. I don't have to have a home church. I can go to any church I want to go to. They're not charismatics. We call those cruisomatics. They just cruise from one church to another. And what happens is, is they don't have a pastor. Now, now, the analogy that's used here is that of a shepherd and a flock. Now, when you look at a flock of sheep, what do sheep have as natural protection? Are they fast? No. Do they have claws? <laughs> no. How about teeth and fangs? <laughs> no. How about a force field? No. How about electricity? Do they shock you? Are there electric sheep? No. Actually, uh, Sheep are, pull, uh, sheep are fairly vulnerable. So, what does a sheep have? What do sheep have for protection? The shepherd. <clears throat> I said, the shepherd. So, what happens when a little sheep says, I don't like where that shepherd's taking us? I don't like the food that we've been eating out of that pasture. I'm just going to go off on my own. And so that little sheep just wanders off and wanders over the hill. What's on the other side of the hill? A coyote. Or a wolf. Or a lion. Or a bear. Can the shepherd protect the little sheep when it's gone off out of his sight? What happens to the little sheep? It gets attacked. So that's what the enemy is doing. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for people that are not submitted and are not operating in humility where a pastor is concerned. Not connected. You, you do understand that the idea of the church was God's idea, not man's. God's the one that set it up this way. And he's the one that took, took, he is the one that placed particular gifts in the body of Christ to help grow us all up. Amen? All right. Well, we're going to stop there for today. I did not get through. But we did cover a lot, didn't we? Hope it'll help you. I, I, I believe that'll be some things that will help you there. Amen. All right. Well, at this time, we would like to receive our morning tithes and offerings, so we would like to do our giving confession. So if you'd stand up with me. And all of us together, repeat this confession. As I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, 
finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs, that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say amen. Amen. You may be seated.